Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, we're gearing up for the 2018 legislative session. I speak with Senate leaders about their priorities, plus proposals to stem opioid abuse and to protect free speech on college campuses. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The 2018 legislative session convenes Tuesday, February 20th. Joining me in the studio to talk about the legislative priorities for the Senate Republican Caucus is the Senate Majority Leader, Paul Gazelka. Welcome. Good to be here again. Recent economic news is, is good news for Minnesota. Our tax revenues for January exceeded expectations. Should that trend continue, where will your caucus priorities be this session? You know, they said we're going to have a shortfall in November, and we said not so. And it's turning out right now we have our over 500 million more projected, and, and maybe it'll be even higher. So, what are we going to do? There's a number of things that we left undone last year. Pensions was one as far as correcting that. But probably the biggest one is what are we going to do with the federal tax bill, and how do we conform to that to make sure that Minnesotans don't pay more state taxes? And so, that'll be like priority one, two, and three for me. Yeah, I w that was my next question, was the tax conformity due to the new federal tax law. My understanding is if nothing is done, Minnesota taxpayers will pay more in taxes. Um, is conformity going to be a bipartisan thing? Do you expect to have a fight over certain things? What, what do you anticipate? So it's the most uh, significant federal tax bill since 1986, so a long time since we've had this significant a change. If we do nothing, Minnesotans don't pay more state taxes but it becomes really, really complicated. And so we, that should not be an option to us. We should conform, but we also want to make sure that Minnesotans aren't paying more taxes. And if we just conform to the changes without conforming to anything else, it's, about, oh, it's over $700 million a year of tax increase to Minnesota. And so we're going to fight to make sure that they don't pay more, but conformity is really important to avoid all the complex problems by not doing it. And how... We don't have to get too detailed, but in general, how will conformity affect the state budget? Well, for example, if we do nothing related to income tax, Minnesota income tax and Minnesota property tax, if you combine those two, the new federal tax code is not going to allow you to deduct more than 10000 in Minnesota, which is about a third of Minnesotans. Uh, the new federal tax law, for example, says that home equity line of credit is no longer deductible. So there's a number of things changing everywhere that we have to look at. It's, it's very complex. I hope we get it done during the session. It has to be our highest priorities. The legislature is currently operated on borrowed funds from the Legislative Coordinating Commission due to the governor's veto of the legislative budget last summer, I yeah. late, early summer. How quickly do you anticipate passing, restoring funding to the legislature? Well, first of all, that was incredibly frustrating. I'm surprised the courts ruled the way they did. but. I had a conversation with the governor immediately after, and he said that he would sign a legislative funding bill uh, right away, and I believe he'll keep true to his word. So we hope to get that done in the first week. I want it to be a clean bill. I, I hope we send him exactly the same bill that uh, we gave to him at, uh, at, as session ended, so there's no, no games, just here's the bill. He said he'd sign it, and, and then we can move on to other things. The Senate Capital Investments Committee is wrapping up their statewide bonding tours, and this is uh, traditionally a bonding year. The governor put forward a $1.5 billion public works proposal. What are your thoughts on the size of the governor's plan? Well, it's a bit generous. Um, what I'll say is uh, even what he offered to the University of Minnesota was more than they were even requesting. It was you know? over $500 million. Yeah, so we want to, we want to, you know. Actually, for the university and for Minsky. Yeah, we passed a very large bonding bill last year for infrastructure. It is important. We focused on, on roads and bridges and, and things like that. Uh, it should be significantly less than a billion dollars in my mind because we just did one. And I wanted to focus on roads and bridges, uh, wastewater infrastructure. There's a lot of communities that don't have the money to fix uh, outdated systems. Uh, I hope we have a focus on mental health uh, because we've been trying to figure out how to fix some of the, the problems related to that where people fall through the cracks. And so, you know, so I, I'm open to doing one. I publicly said that, but I want to make sure that it's also a responsible bill. You specifically pointed out the need for improvements to Highway 10 in Wadena. Should 
transportation projects like that be a part of the bonding bill? Last year there was a lot of discussion about a dedicated funding stream. I even heard a possible constitutional mm -hmm. amendment for auto parks sales tax yeah. to be directed towards road and bridge construction and maintenance. How do we handle, I mean, there's a lot of need in Minnesota. Is one bonding bill enough? Do we need to dedicate different streams? How should that be worked out in your view? Yeah, transportation is a very high priority for me and it, it should be for everyone. Roads and bridges determine commerce and travel and everything else that we want to do. So last year we, we dedicated some of the sales tax on auto parts to transportation, tr to roads and bridges. And then we also supplemented that with more money in our bonding or infrastructure bill towards roads and bridges. I want to do that same kind of thing this year so that we keep moving towards uh, improving our, our infrastructure, particularly roads and bridges. As far as a constitutional amendment, I'm open to that. Uh, I think you, you see the trades now asking us to do that. Chamber of Commerce thinks it's a good idea so that we have money that's going to be there that we can plan long term to make sure that we take care of all of those things. And so. I'm open. I don't know if we're going to do it yet or not, but I, I have an openness to it. What's you said your number for bonding is around one billion. Is that correct? You wouldn't want to go no, beyond I said that. Significantly less. Significantly than a billion. less. Do you, do you want to give me so, a number? No, I don't at this point. But I, you know, I, that that is a number that I do not want to go over. Um, I think it. I, I heard that uh, our formula would say that we should have about eight hundred million dollars as a maximum, uh, but that's where the negotiation will be with the governor. Nationally, President Trump has put forward an aggressive proposal to improve the nation's infrastructure, and he campaigned on improving the nation's infrastructure. How does that fit into your view of Minnesota and, and protecting, increasing wastewater, clean water, roads, highways? Can you talk a little more about yeah, that? Well, particularly when we're working on roads and bridges, it is a cooperation of the federal government, state, county, local. And so by them you know, making this a high priority, uh, it'll allow us to work towards the same things that we want as well. Uh, for example, Highway 10 in Wadena, you brought that one up. You know, we, we got into the depth of that, and it's, it's a huge number to fix that particular road. And people have been trying to do it for 40 years, but they always turn away because the price tag is too much. And so that's one of many bridges and highways that uh, you know, people end up not getting what should be done. With the federal government engaging, if they engage at a higher number, then some of these projects that have been delayed perhaps now can get done. What is your view of this session? Are you, do you have an optimistic view of the progress that's going to happen this year? So I'm always optimistic. I, I approached last year of let's get things done and we had the most productive session we've had in, in decades. Tax relief, transportation bill, real ID, stop the collapse of health care, education reform, education funding, bonding bill. I mean it was very, very productive. At the very end, uh, a number of things happened related to the funding of the legislative branch and now the president of the Senate uh, having to become lieutenant governor. Uh, those are frustrating things that uh, I could not control but were thrust upon us. Uh, but I'm still going to focus on let's have a productive session. How do we do that? Well, part of it is one of the things that are good for Minnesota. Let's focus on those and I'm going to reach across the aisle because that's the only way you're going to accomplish some of these things. And I do think we'll, we'll align with the federal government on tax bill. I do think we'll have a, a good transportation bill. We'll look at things like MINLARS. I mean, there's a real problem there. Uh, elder abuse, there's a real problem there. We need, we need oversight over, that, uh, over the executive branch and how they've been doing those things. But in the end, I think we'll look back and say we had another good session. Senator Kozalka, it's always such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. This week at the Capitol, Governor Mark Dayton, agency leaders and bipartisan lawmakers introduced a broad initiative to combat the opioid epidemic in Minnesota. The opioid epidemic is afflicting people all over Minnesota as uh, it is nationwide. 2016, there were 395 uh, total opioid deaths. It was an 18% increase over 2015, the year before. 194 of those overdose deaths involved prescription opioids. 150 overdose dose deaths involved heroin. And of course, that doesn't count the, the literally thousands of lives that have been destroyed and families and communities whose lives and existence have been 
destroyed with that. The action plan, which others can elaborate on, will focus on, on four key areas, prevention, emergency response, treatment and recovery, and law enforcement. And those ongoing efforts should not be paid by Minnesota taxpayers, but rather by the people who created this problem. And I urge the industry to support this measure, and I urge the legislature to enact it. And as Governor Dayton has mentioned, we need our drug manufacturers to step in and say, we are ready to help now with some finances because we can't do it alone. Minnesota taxpayers have been funding this bill, have been um, finding every option we can to educate people, but we are running short of the resources needed to really help treatment centers, to help counties with child protection services that are that are being upside down with their budgets because families are sick with addiction. Uh, we need more naloxone in the field for first responders. And we just need more partners at the table to say, you're willing to help now. I know that the uh, pharmaceutical companies had the data, they had the studies that showed them that these drugs were dangerously addictive. And they did pursue um, trying to get doctors to prescribe them more to make money. And whether their intention was to addict the, the uh, populace or not, that's what happened. And I'm, um, like many parents who've lost children to this, I'm pretty angry about that. And I don't see any reason why the taxpayers should have to pay to fix this. The question when it comes up, is this a fee or is it a tax? Let's call it whatever you want to call it. And I don't typically like a stewardship fee or a tax. I mean, I'm a Republican for crying out loud, and I don't like the sound of that. But what I will tell you is, for this issue today, this is the best option for us to help fix this problem. Because I haven't seen anything when we've done a stewardship fee before in Minnesota on car batteries, electronics, rubber tires. But this is people are dying. And this is the time that we call whatever we want to call it. But I think we need to ask the folks out there that can help us with a fee or a tax, but this is very specific about how it will get spent to help communities in recovery. And at a Capitol press conference, Senator Carla Nelson and several university students introduced a bill designed to fight liberal bias and preserve free speech at state-funded college campuses. If we want students to be involved and informed, uh, we must not limit uh, the speech, the dialogue, and the debate. Across Minnesota, our campuses are thankfully rich with religious, ethnic, and racial diversity. But too often, students find themselves frustrated on their campuses by lack of intellectual diversity and lack of encouragement of political thought. Stifling free speech on campus leads to an environment of bias, indoctrination, and intellectual bullying. Other groups plan events at the University of Minnesota every day without campus oversight. We need to continue at our universities to guarantee equal access and safety at all events without limiting the number of students who can participate. And I do not understand how the University of Minnesota, our flagship university, that gets uh, millions and millions of dollars each year in infrastructure for buildings, uh, cannot provide a suitable building uh, for the college Republicans who are bringing a national speaker here. So uh, that is just one example. The bill is much broader than that, and that is protecting, of course, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of press for all of our students on uh, public institutions, higher education institutions. Joining me in the studio to provide the Senate DFL caucus perspective on the priorities for the 2018 legislative session is the Senate Minority Leader Tom Bach. Welcome. Pleasure to be with you. The first significant reform of the federal tax code since 1986 has been accomplished. And now the debate as to how much and in what ways Minnesota tax law will conform to the new federal tax law will begin. You're on the tax committee. What are your thoughts? Well, generally, we like to do tax conformity. Uh, the certified public accountants, the CPAs, always want us to be in conformity. And uh, what that means is when people file their federal tax return, that we then just pick up the federal return, 
plug the state return into that federal taxable income. If we're not in conformity, what accountants have to do is after you do your federal return, you transfer that federal taxable income number over to your Minnesota return, and then you have to add back changes where the Minnesota law is not consistent with the federal one. So uh, for the most part, we try to conform. We're generally mostly in conformity, but we are badly out of conformity right now with all of these changes that were passed federally. It is going to be one of the bigger challenges of the session to get into federal tax conformity uh, because if we do that, it's going to raise taxes on Minnesotans. It's going to raise your Minnesota tax liability by something more than $500 million uh, in 2018 and about $600 million a year in the years beyond that. Uh, you know, the tax, the federal tax bill wasn't a very good bill for Minnesota. That's why if we conform, Minnesota taxes are going to go up. Uh, for states that are heavily dependent on income taxes, like Minnesota is, uh, for our revenue source, uh, we didn't benefit like many of the other states that don't have uh, significant income taxes. Yet. So if taxes were to go up then in Minnesota, it's well, it's a question of taxes go up in Minnesota or serv services and budgets go down. Is that kind of the trade-off then that, no, if, that'll if be debated? No, if we do nothing, Minnesota will uh, continue to collect the same amount of revenue that we do now. But it'll make uh, getting your 2018 um, Minnesota tax form very complicated for CPAs. Uh, so uh, the challenge, I think, is going to be, I think there's general agreement among the legislature that uh, we should do federal tax conformity. I think the question is going to be if we do that and taxes actually go up by something north of $500 million next year, how do we in that bill then keep those people whole that are impacted by us doing conformity? And we, we often call that a revenue neutral bill. We're going to raise some money in the bill because of conformity raises money. And then how do we then spend the money in the tax bill so that at the end of the day, the bill doesn't raise any money at all. It's revenue neutral on, uh, on uh, Minnesotans. But the challenge always is it's very hard to keep everybody whole. So oftentimes you have to put in some additional money over above what you raise in order to get, mitigate some of the outliers that are negatively impacted by doing conformity. So tax conformity will be one thing that the legislature tackles this session. I assume bonding may also be another big issue this session. The governor proposed a $1.5 billion public works package with funds directed towards state colleges and universities, local water and housing infrastructure, and preserving state assets. Are you in agreement with the size and the scope of the governor's proposal? I think it's about the right size, uh, but unfortunately at the legislature there is kind of this sticker shock about doing anything over a billion dollars. It, it's purely an arbitrary number, but, and actually if you went back to uh, the days of Governor Arne Carlson and you adjusted one or two of his bonding bills for in, the cost of inflation spending and construction, the bills back in the 90s would have been higher than a billion today, significantly higher, more along the lines of what the governor's number is. Uh, so you agree that it could be more than a billion? Well, I think, it's, I, I think it should be, and mm -hmm. I also think uh, it's going to be unlikely that it is. So what I actually have proposed uh, is let's do a billion-dollar bill. Let's just agree that there's this arbitrary cap. It's a billion dollars. Let's do that. But then let's do a standalone bill outside of that that just addresses maintenance because we keep falling behind in uh, deferred maintenance in state buildings, whether it's at Minsky, the U of M, at DNR. Uh, over at the Public Facilities Authority uh, for wastewater infrastructure. We're billions of dollars behind there on work we know that needs to be done. Uh, and what happens when you put a bill together, and I can guarantee you the governor's bill, uh, even if we were going to do the $1.5 billion that he proposed, much of the deferred maintenance would fall out because the legislature wants to do new shiny things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not a criticism. Fixing that old things is not as interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, tuck pointing a building or mm -hmm. putting a new roof on a building or uh, new windows or a heating and uh, ventilation, ventilation system is just not as uh, fun uh, as building new stuff. Putting a new wing on the college or, mm -hmm. or building a new library somewhere is, is just uh, something that especially in the House where they have to run for office every two years. This is an election year for them. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to deliver some projects to take home to their district and say, hey, you know, I mean, I was successful uh, getting something that's very important to one of their communities. So it is the deferred maintenance stuff that always tends to fall out of the bill. 
So there's an agreement that we should do deferred maintenance, but uh, so my thought is let's do a billion dollar bill with all the stuff that we all agree we wanna do. And then let's set off on the side all the maintenance and let's do a separate deferred maintenance bill uh, for, and just agree that, you know, there's all this state infrastructure that we're not keeping up with and the public certainly knows that as it relates to transportation and roads and bridges. Let's do a separate bill on maintenance on just, so it doesn't have to compete uh, with uh, the demands of, 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 the, of the members' projects. So, so I'm gonna continue to talk about that. I, I don't think we've ever done that, uh, but we keep falling further and further behind on the, on the maintenance of the existing state assets that we have. So bonding for new things, uh, a package for state asset preservation, mm -hmm. then there's transportation. Uh, some of the transportation items were in last year's bonding bill. Are you still in favor of a dedicated funding stream for transportation? How do you want to handle highway and road infrastructure? Well, some of that can probably be done like last year and last year's bonding bill. There was some pretty significant money for uh, transportation in there. Uh, it does make some sense to bond for transportation projects because, what, for instance, if we build a new bridge, uh, why should only today's tax, if you use cash, why should only today's taxpayers have to pay for it when the, the traveling public is going to benefit from them for 40 or 50 years. Maybe debt service on bonds so that future taxpayers pay for that investment is the right thing. So uh, bonding for transportation I actually think it is okay. It just is you only have so much capacity there right. and yet because you have to have the revenue stream to pay the debt service on the bonds. So I've all supported the idea of getting some new money into our transportation infrastructure system. There's a lot of resistance to the gas tax or to license tabs. Uh, so I do think there'll be a conversation this session about the idea of, of the sales tax that's related to motor vehicles, tires, windshields, auto parts. That money uh, being dedicated that for? We, we dedicated that last year in the transportation bill, a piece of it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the challenge with that is, is how do you, when you just do that statutorily, the next legislature can undo it. So it probably, to really put a transportation plan together and, and to bond for projects, you need a guaranteed revenue stream. So it almost has to be constitutionally dedicated revenue. One last question. Uh, will funding to rest well, will a bill to restore funding to the legislature be the first thing out of the gate when session starts? You know, the, the four leaders have talked about that. It's, a, uh, it's not as easy as it might sound because, uh, you know, the legislature, members of the legislature got significant raises on July 1st mm -hmm. as a result of the Constitution Amendment and the Compensation Council that was created. Uh, all of our staff are going to get raises uh, that uh, parallel what other state employees got. That's all baked into the legislative budget. And people can argue, well, you're not voting for a pay raise. And you know, the Senate has the benefit of not being on the ballot until 20, so it's probably a little bit easier for the Senate to pass it than over in the House, but I think there are gonna be, it's kind of like voting on your own pay increase when in this budget cycle, legislators are getting raises, and that money's in the budget to pay those raises. So it's, uh, and, and it gets complicated by the fact that we have borrowed a millions and millions of dollars from the Legislative Coordinating Commission in order right. to keep the legislature running in the absence of a budget. So how does that get paid back? How does that get considered relative to the appropriation so we'll, to the state budget? So it's a little more complicated than just taking up what we passed last year. And, and so we'll have to stay it. tuned. Senator Bach, I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. Governor Dayton and legislative leaders met for the annual pre-session briefing this week. The panel fielded questions from reporters on a number of topics, including whether they can move beyond the tumult of last session and whether they predict a surplus in the upcoming budget forecast. Here are some highlights. And do you think you can truly, all of you, start fresh and new despite a haul of the ill will that was developed between lawsuits and special elections and machinations trying to change control in the Senate. Can we really have a productive session? Well, I'm certainly want to set all that aside. I've had very good meetings one-on-one uh, -on -one with the speaker and with the majority leader and, of course, with the DFL leaders. You know, we're all elected to perform responsibilities that are very important to the state of Minnesota, as the speaker just said. You know, we, everybody in Minnesota has a stake in 
what we can accomplish, uh, which we'll have our differences for sure, but also working together, this whole tax, federal tax bill and the impact on Minnesota, hugely uh, complex, but vitally important, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, on the line there. We're gonna have to work together or we're gonna have a stalemate and uh, Minnesotans will have a extremely complicated tax forms to be filling out a year from now. So and, and I will say, you know, the last lawsuit uh, didn't go well for our side, and yet uh, the governor called and said, I'm, I want to move forward. Uh, I'm going to, you know, just send me that uh, legislative budget, and I'll take care of it. And um, that is his goodwill going forward. We're going to say the same thing. We, we have to deal with the federal tax bill. I think that's the number one thing. A number of folks uh, want us to do something related to an infrastructure, a bonding bill, and a host of other issues. And so that doesn't happen unless you have some sense of, of respect for each other and knowing that we all want to do it, what's right for Minnesota, and I think we will. And the Senate is very fortunate uh, right now in that both the majority leader and the minority leader are Iron Rangers. Uh, probably never had a situation like that uh, before. Uh, Senator Gazelka is a very proud former captain of the Virginia Blue Devil basketball team. So uh, that's uh, a, a good little tidbit of Senate history, but I, I don't believe that's ever been the case before. We actually, I feel like we have a very, very good relationship. Uh, I did call him before a lawsuit was ever filed and say, you know, this is just business and I, I don't want it to uh, affect our relationship and be able to get uh, work done during the upcoming session. Uh, there's uh, a great deal to be done. I think we'll, there'll be a great deal of bipartisan work done. The, our personalities should never get in the way of uh, doing the work that people sent us here to do. And, and um, I said earlier, and I'll repeat, I think the, the problem, if we just focus on solving the problems that I think are, are the, the biggest issues that face Minnesotans and the ones that they expect us to work on this session, uh, if we focus on that instead of politics and, and elections and other things, uh, I think we can work together really well and I think we can be very successful this session. The system is designed for there to be conflict. The idea is that the clash of ideas will result in the best compromise for Minnesotans. But people shouldn't confuse our disagreements about policy with personal dislike for one another. I think we all get along pretty well and we have pretty decent communications. Uh, we just have very different views of how to serve the state. Want to know what each one of you would predict the budget forecast will show? Deficit? or surplus and the figure. Senator Bach, start with you. Uh, I think it will project a surplus. How much? Uh, less than a billion. I said in November with the uh, forecast that uh, I thought it was, it would be more like a billion dollar surplus. I'll just stick to that number. Governor? Surplus, you know, I keep looking in the drawer for the Rudy Purposes pieces of paper with those, but I can't find it, so I, I'm not going to predict the number, but it'll, I think we'll have a surplus this year and the next biennium. Speaker? $600 million surplus. Leader Hortman? $643 million. <laughs> we, we have an <laughs> almost agreement there. <laughs>